Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board from Monday, September 27th, 2021. This is Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes. John Hurd? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. Eric Helmut? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Marr is participating remotely. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021, that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1, 2022, of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely, so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. Finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. We have a full agenda tonight this, this evening, so let's see how much of the town's business we can get done. I'll now turn to the next agenda item, which is a presentation of the new DP Department of Public Works facility. Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Mr. Rademacher will be joining us. Oh, here he is. Good evening, Mr. Rademacher. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Select Board. I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, I'd like to uh, Spend a few minutes to give you an update on the progress of our uh, construction at 51 Grove Street for the DPW and um, facility project, and then answer any questions you might have. I, I believe um, that, you know there's been a lot of obviously some talk at town meetings, so this project has been um, discussed for a while. But just to refresh your memories, we are renovating the existing buildings at 51 Grove Street. Uh, some will be renovated for vehicle storage and two will be renovated to allow for other town departments to move in. Uh, and then we're also building a new facility, which will be the administration building and the motor equipment repair facility for public works. The project is occurring in two phases. Phase one is renovating one of the buildings at an accelerated rate to, to be able to accommodate the IT department moving out of the high school. and Phase one also is the construction of the new admin and facility building. Once that building is complete, which we expect to be mid to late next summer, early fall, an entire public works will move into the new building and the remaining buildings will be renovated on site. Uh, I'll give a, a little bit update on where we are with schedule and I have some construction photos I can show just to give you an update, like a little pictorial of what we've been so far. But as, a, as I mentioned, the emphasis right now is on what we're calling uh, Building A, which is the building that I used to reside in. Uh, I was uh, kicked out, so we can start renovation there. Um, and that has been and going very well. We started in earnest in late spring, and uh, renovation and, uh, and uh, demolition of the interior began fairly immediately. We have a tight schedule to meet the IT department's uh, needs for moving their server room out of the high school. So we have uh, got a good jump start on that building. 
and as for the rest of the site, it, it didn't go quite as fast. As you all probably know, we have um, a very constrained site space-wise, as well as challenges with um, soils and soil conditions. So there was a lot of due diligence in formulating um, health and safety plans, as well as, well as enlisting uh, licensed, licensed site professionals, which are basically environmental specialists. Um, both the contractor and the design team have an LSP and they provide checks and balances uh, over one another um, throughout, throughout the project. And, and the project contractor also has enlisted a, a, um, an, an industrial hygienist to also oversee all of the excavations and monitor the site during construction for uh, the presence of contamination and to be sure the workplace is kept um, safe. So the site work hasn't, we, we've been doing a lot of above grade site work. We've been dem demolishing concrete walls and um, getting you know, infrastructure down that does not pose a, a risk per se for uh, uh, environmental concern. Uh, and, and all the while we're still doing some test pits to better uh, delineate the contaminations that we're going to be encountering when we get into excavation in earnest. So if it's, if, if it's okay, I can show some pictures and then I can answer some questions or... Um... Yeah, no, I think that'd be great. If, okay. if it can, we can share the screen with you there for, for okay. the pictures. Uh, let's see. Do I have permissions to share screen? You yeah. should now. Is it... Yep, let me check here. Make sure. Is that visible to everybody? Okay. Yes. So th th this is a, a rendering of what the new administrative building uh, will be. It's just on there. My project manager likes to put this picture on everything. Uh, so that's a, a good image of what we're heading for. Are, and Mr. Rademacher, before you go on, just for the yeah. public's benefit as well, this building will be where the current parking lot is um, at the at the existing site, correct? That is correct. This will be okay. this this building will extend essentially from the curb line. the The black um, <clears throat> surface you see in the in the foreground of that picture is essentially Grove Street, and this building okay. will extend to the back where the uh, salt sheds used to be at the property. Okay. Thank you. And these are photos from uh, July through current September. We, we started with securing the site and installing staging on, this is building B where, as I said, we're accelerating the, the renovation for, um, in order to facilitate IT and facilities when they're asked to leave the high school. So this was just some preliminary fencing and staging so the roof could be accessible. Some interior pictures, uh, there was some lead paint and asbestos demolition that needed to occur within the building. And part of the safety plan was to tape and cover all ventilation and uh, exterior openings so that the air could be filtered and not escape without being properly treated during that uh, re remediation and, and abatement process. This is just some more images of that pre-work for the abatement. Uh, it was a lot of work to do that to prep for those two tasks. See the a lot of a lot of the interior walls and ceiling coming down, exposing some of the old ductwork um, within the building. This is actually the in, the old engineering department for the town of Arlington for the past thirty plus years. Uh, this was again the windows were removed and they were filled with the plywood and plastic to allow the demolition to occur. And this is a little bit more pictorial of what what's exposed in some of the of some of the rooms. This will be this will be an area where the facilities department, when they're relocated from the high school, this will be a brand new space 
with state-of-the-art uh, equipment for their trades. Uh, this is being fully renovated for that purpose. Here's the remnants of our old salt shed. It was a timber and steel structure that came down rather quickly. And the materials are sorted so they can be recycled. The, the building is the site and the building is being constructed with LEED certification, which is a sustainability and environmentally friendly process. So the materials need to be sorted and uh, recycled appropriately when possible. Just uh, another picture of the interior of building B, some of the old framing and plumbing exposed. The facility is being completely renovated. Building B is with uh, new bathrooms, kitchens, meeting space, and offices for both IT and facilities. Upstairs on building B, this actually was where my office used to be. Uh, it's not recognizable to me any longer. Uh, all the walls were taken down, ceiling taken down. It was amazing that there was about four feet, three to four feet of space above the ceiling that was in there. I never realized that. The floors had to be leveled a bit uh, due to the age, though plywood was installed throughout. This is uh, the delivery of HVAC. We're already to a point in this building where we're installing a lot of the duct work and HVAC componentry for the finished product. More of the materials delivered on site. And the rooms being framed, again, for, for those purposes. Outside, as I mentioned, while we are still buttoning up the uh, the evaluation of the soil condition and, and planning for that activity. We started on above grade work. So here, I don't know if you all remember, there was a concrete wall, which kind of encompassed the entire upper portion of the site from the parking lot, as well as the old uh, soccer field behind Stop and Shop. And that wall is, it was demoed and is still in the process of being demoed. And that material will be crushed and actually used as fill on site. It can be, it can be um, crushed and graded such that it'll act as uh, gravel and can be used under some of the construction, which helps to limit our costs for buying, having to buy new material and also for having to um, dispose of existing construction debris. This is a picture of uh, like one of the one of the uh, test pits that I mentioned. Again, we are doing a significant amount of due diligence in testing the soil in random locations, thought out, but um, random locations throughout the site, so that when we get into the actual excavations, these soils won't need to be further tested at that point. They can be loaded directly into a vehicle and trucked from the site, minimizing the time they spent either covered or taking up space uh, on the project site. It, it serves two purposes. We have limited room on the property for such storage, and it also just gets these materials off the property uh, as soon as possible, limiting any risk or exposure. This is a bit more demolition. This was the, the, the town when we handled our own solid waste collection 30 maybe years ago. Uh, we had a scale and a transfer station on site. And this was part of that transfer station that allowed us to put the solid waste onto trucks and have it trucked out. It hasn't been used as a transfer station in many years. It was storage for us. That essentially is, ends the pictures of where we are today. Um, so I believe we, once we get the soils uh, well defined and, and 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 determined throughout the site and where we plan on excavating, we're going to be going um, pretty earnestly into excavation and the construction of footings for the new building. 
that kind of wraps up what I have to say and where we're at on the project. I'm sure there are questions or maybe I missed or overlooked something, but I'm happy to answer anyone's question. Great, thank you, Mr. Rademacher. I'll, I'll now turn to the board for questions and comments. Um, I'll start with Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, uh, Mr. Rademacher. Great presentation. Uh, uh, I really appreciate the materials. I mean, I uh, just want to know where I can get one of those um, pneumatic foam units. I mean, it looks like a pretty interesting device uh, to, to, to handle. I mean, uh, uh, lots of interesting specs with it. And, and uh, I, mean, I have some, I mean, just some minor stuff that really isn't worth going overall. I mean, it's just more I me mean, just kind of curiosity stuff. So I'm, I'm going to pass this time. So thank you for your time. And thanks for a great, great, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this and for your diligence with the, uh, the safety plans. I was glad to read through those and to know that that's really been given a lot of thought and, and care. Uh, how are you experiencing any or anticipating any you know, delays in the construction due to uh, construction material supply uh, pipeline issues that have been you know, piling up nationally? Uh, thank you. That's a good question. We have, unfortunately, already um, received news that the, the steel for the new building, there may be a delay. That building is being, the front half is being built conventionally on site with steel framing, um, where the pieces are kind of delivered and the contractor puts it together. The rear portion, that's a, it's called a prefect, pre fabricated manufactured building and that will become an assembled by the by the steel company that um, prefab building we're told oh there's been a delay uh, in the production of the steel and the material so what we when when we originally started this project we were hoping for an August uh, moving date and that's been pushed to end of October got it yeah great thank you very much sure. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question is the GC general contractor on this, is it Commodore Builders or Cash and Associates? It is Commodore Builders. It is. Um, and the questions that I have um, are motivated by my other day job in terms of general contractor, subcontractors, and sub-subcontractors. So my first question would be um, around AHA's uh, activity hazard analysis and job hazard analysis uh, reports on facets of the job. Um, who has responsibility for those? Are they done daily? Are they done weekly? Um, and sort of who, who tracks them? Commodore is ultimately responsible for safety on the site. Uh, they have a, a, an employee assigned to be the safety uh, monitor. Um, and they have each trade and vendor that comes to the site is required to have a competent person, someone trained in the work that they're doing and to train to know that the environment they're gonna be working in, so the hazards that are present. Uh, and these are all spelled out in the, the hazardous material uh, health and safety plan that was um, drafted by Cashman, uh, Cashins and Associates. Uh, so the, the competent individuals for each vendor are required to understand and work with that document. And Commodore's safety uh, officer holds toolbox talk meetings daily in order to um, ensure that they're being followed and people are aware of the work that's going to happen that day and, and what to expect. Okay, my other question would be, um, from my limited experience in this, um, that's a good process that's been outlined, especially with the two box talks, the AHAs, the JHAs, but do we have any sub-subcontractors on this project? And my follow-up question to that would be, are they uh, included in the two box talk? Because most times they're not, and that's where the accidents happen. Well, they, they should be, and I can verify that that happens. Um, the, 
each contract is uh, assigned competent person would need to be responsible that anyone working for them or subbed to them is aware of the work that's occurring in the hazard. So I can verify that the subs to subs are included with those talks. Uh, I see no reason why they, they wouldn't be. No, if you could definitely do that, especially with sub sub. Yeah. Um, and a point of reference to that would be um, Tim Sigley was the GC on the Wuben Public Library project. If you Google 2017 Wuben Public Library, um, you'll see that a worker for a sub subcontractor died, was killed on the job, and uh, the sub subcontractor wasn't included in anything, including the competent person, which I think is a really important thing. And the only reason I raise it is we're, we're talking about hazardous waste, which I know Mr. Ranamaka, it has been definitely on top of, but I, I want to make sure that not only our GC and sub or sub subcontractors are protected, but also our um, current GPW workers also are protected from. So my question to that would be, in terms of our current GPW employees, as well as our police employees that used to go down later gas up, um, what mitigation or protection or um, advice have they been given in terms of access to that site? Are they, are they being told, don't come down right now, don't come down in six months, come down in a protected way? Uh, so the site, all the work contained for the project is, in, is being um, partitioned off with fencing. So anyone that goes through that fencing onto the site, the construction work would need to follow the, the health and safety plan and be trained accordingly. Uh, currently, there is no reason for DPW or any town personnel to enter the site um, within that the confines of that um, protective fencing. So uh, if that were to change, we would, um, change the training accordingly, but currently it, it, the only staff required to be within that construction zone are those of the contractor and the subs. Okay, and then I think my last question is, I know a lot of our school buses are housed, parked on the original DPW parking lot site. Is that still the case? If not, where are they and where will they be in the future? Uh, that's a good question. The school buses were housed in public works, but we, we did not have the space, <laughs> excuse me, the space to um, accommodate them during construction. And I believe they found space at St. Camillus. They, rent, they are renting space at St. Camillus parking lot um, for the duration of this project and even beyond because we're taking on uh, other town departments at this site, I, I don't believe we'll have space for them to return and we'll have to find a long-term solution for those buses. Okay, thank you for um, your answers on that. And if you could just um, follow up on the sub subcontractor question that they're also attending, um, A, attending the toolbox talks, including their competent person, as well as um, they're not only aware of the AHA and JHA, but they're not signing some sort of attended sheet that they have received that information and are aware of it and are implementing it. So, it, and I only say that because in terms of, uh, especially with hazardous waste or anything else, uh, in terms of construction, that seems to be the area that is sort of nebulous that the GC and the subcontractor know and, and follow construction guidelines around AHAs or JHAs, but sub subcontractors um, whether by coincidence or I don't want to say design, um, they kind of flip through the loops. And I'm, I'm just concerned as Mr. Rademacher is and the town manager, especially around the hazardous uh, environmental issues on the site. So if you could just check on that sub subcontract, make sure the competent person's fall, make sure they're at two box tops when they should be. They shouldn't mm -hmm. be there every day, but when they're part of the project, they're taking over. Um, that that's all being followed. So I don't mean to be super paranoid, but everybody who knows me 
<laughs> no, that's who I am. And I do want to thank um, the chair, uh, Mr. DeCourcy, for having this on as an agenda item, as well as my colleague, town manager, Mr. Rademacher, because it's, it's very important to all of us. Um, safety, not only of all our employees, but um, all of our temporary employees. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Before I turn to to Mr. Hurd, I, I do want to verify again that, that the school bus fleet is up at Sankin Mills. If you're traveling Route 2 westbound and you look into the lot, they're all lined up there across um, on on the, the, the far end of the lot there. So uh, with that, I will turn to Mr. Hurd. I can verify that as well. My boys get a kick out of driving down Dow Ave and seeing the row of school buses there. Um, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Rademacher. Um, I don't know if it's appropriate for a motion to receive the presentation, which I'll do at this time. Um, and I just would just say it's exciting. This has been a few years coming. It's exciting to see the plans again, to refresh our memories as to what we're going to see there. There's definitely been a need for it. I remember the presentation showing where our million dollar fleet was sitting outside to, to the elements before and, and the reason that we have to have it. Um, so just one question is in regards to the fleet of DBW vehicles, are they during the construction still gonna be housed on site? We, thank you, it's uh, a good question. We have, some of them are on site and we have moved a portion of our operations to a Rider Street where the uh, Lalacata landscaping used to uh, reside. Uh, we that lease ended and and they they ended their lease with the town. So we were able to take that property. So uh, our natural resources department is there, and and the fleet associated with the natural resources is at Ryder Street, and highway and water are at um, Grove Street. So we have the same amount of space for those two groups now separated, but um, in in different locations. So we're spread out, but we we have decent facilities. Okay. Just want to make sure that they're proximate, as I can imagine, during a snow emergency when everyone's kind of running around. It, yeah. It's good to hear that they're close by and ready to go. Yeah. But like I said, it's exciting, and I look forward to the finished product. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hurd. And before I give my comments, could I have a second on Mr. Hurd's motion to receive Mr. Rademacher's report? Look at that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Rademacher for the presentation and, and for the materials that you provided to the board um, with the safety measures and, and uh, also tonight's presentation. And, and I know you and I have talked about this site. You gave me a tour of the site a few years ago, and there are so many challenges because of the history of the site. A, a long time ago, it was a manufactured gas plant, and with the brook running through the site and the culvert, there's just all sorts of challenges, but I think at the end of the day, um, we're gonna have a much better facility and a much safer facility for our DPW workers because the, the conditions were very challenging to say the least um, in the existing building and structure. So we're looking forward to the to the project continuing and, and, and getting done and hopefully there, there aren't any further delays. And, and just one aside, that, that photo number 16 brought back some memories because I was in high school um, in the days that the transfer station existed. And I actually was in the top floor of the A building. And there was many an afternoon where I'd, I'd see the trash trucks come in, dump the trash in, when there was a slow afternoon, uh, seventh period at Arlington High. So it's a little trip down memory lane for me there, but I uh, appreciate the, the presentation. Thank you. Okay. So on a motion to receive from Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Unanimous vote. Great. Thank you, Mr. Rademacher. And I'm happy to say we got you on early tonight. You, you've you been uh, hanging around with us for a while uh, the past few meetings. So thank you. Thank you for your time. And I hope to be back you know, on a regular basis to be able to provide updates as we proceed. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Okay, item three is a proclamation honoring Dr. Stanley E. Sagoff. I don't know if Dr. Sagoff is with us tonight. Mr. Chairman, I don't see him. I'm not positive whether or not we were expecting him, but I don't I don't see him on the, the list right okay. now. Okay. 
All right, so I'd, I'd like to read the, the proclamation and ask, then ask for a confirmatory vote from the board. And this is to honor Dr. Stanley Edward Sagoff, um, who just retired from his practice in Arlington. So I will now read the proclamation. Uh, whereas Dr. Stanley Edward Sagoff was born March 11th, 1944 in Cape Town, South Africa. And whereas Dr. Sagoff attended Seapoint Boys High School in Cape Town and was a rugby and cricket star athlete, and whereas Dr. Sagoff graduated from the University of Cape Town Medical School in 1967, and whereas Dr. Sagoff graduated from the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston in 1973, and is now the leader of the Remembering the Future Jazz Band, and whereas Dr. Sagoff started Family Practice Group in 1974 in Cambridge and moved the practice to Arlington in 1999, and whereas Family Practice Group changed its name to Family Practice Group, the Sagoff Center for Family Medicine, and whereas Dr. Sagoff has been a leader and contributor to Mount Auburn Hospital and the surrounding community, and whereas Dr. Sagoff has taught and mentored hundreds of medical students and residents, now therefore be it resolved that we, the members of the select board, proclaim September 19, 2021, Dr. Stanley E. Sagoff Day in the town of Arlington in celebration of his extraordinary medical career and his 47 years of service to patients, learners, and colleagues. We are honored to wish him good health, happiness, and prosperity on behalf of the past, present, and future residents of the town in celebration of his service to Arlington and beyond. And um, if we have an affirmative vote that will be signed by each of the members of the select board. Um, so with that, I will turn to the board, uh, Mr. Helmut. Uh, thank you. And do you require a motion, Mr. Chair? Yes, yeah, if I could. Yes, yeah, so, uh, is it to move approval? Yes. Yeah, thank you. My first one for these. Uh, sure. Happy to move approval. And I, I have to say, um, what a wonderful uh, story of a life and, and of service to the community. Uh, resonates with me a little extra as a, as a fellow bivocational a person who's also a musician in addition to a, a day job and some other pursuits. Uh, I can appreciate the extra richness of that life. And uh, it is, it's a pleasure to learn about Dr. Sagoff and to thank him in this way for his service uh, to the world, to the community. Great, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Oh, we just need you to, uh, if you could unmute your, your microphone. Sorry, I'm doing the phone and the <laughs> laptop and everything's going in and out. I would definitely second Mr. Hamlet's motion um, as well as uh, thank Dr. Sagoff, um, not only for his, his 47 years of service um, to his patients and colleagues, but more importantly to the interns, residents, and other practitioners that he uh, counseled and trained along the way because um, that's just a, a vital um, uh, importance of this job as anything else. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also just want to thank Dr. Sagoff. I am a former patient of the family practice group, um, which is a really excellent practice group down there. It has a great group of doctors, physicians, nurses, and staff. Um, and certainly a well-deserved honor and a well uh, a life well lived. So I'm happy to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Yes, and of course, I'm happy to support it too. Hope to meet the guy. Uh, and I'll, <laughs> certainly a clever name for a jazz band, I mean, remembering the future. And in doing my, my research, you know, I found some stuff on YouTube. It's actually pretty good. You know, so so um, take a little search. I mean, uh, nice, nice. Um, Nice music, especially for relaxing after one of these select board meetings. Uh, so, thanks. Great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. And I, I'm happy to support this as well. I want to congratulate Dr. Sagoff uh, in his retirement and, and for his years of service to, to, to Arlington residents, the Mount Auburn community, and, and uh, all his patients. Um, so with a motion by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmer? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. 
Thank you, Attorney Hine. Okay, we next move to the consent agenda, which is items four through eight. Uh, this big night for contractor drain layer licenses. Uh, item four is administrative changes to the minutes of meeting August 9th, 2021. Item five is a request for a contractor drain layer license for Bully Excavation LLC. Item six is a request for a contractor drain layer license for Good Hands Contractor Incorporated. Item seven is a request for a contractor drain layer license for Middlesex Asphalt Services. Item eight is a request for a contractor drain layer license for TDS Incorporated. Um, I will now turn to the board, Mrs. Mahan. Uh, let's move approval. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Second. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. No comment. Mr. Helmuth. No comments, thank you. Okay, on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Item nine is a public hearing. We're uh, after the start of the public hearing, so we, we can we can begin it. Uh, for Regis Road, a request to repair private way and a betterment order request from uh, Lisa Gottlieb, I believe is a resident of Regis Road. So if we could promote her. Just did she should be joining us right now. Good evening, Ms. Gottlieb. Hello. How um, are you? If you? Good, how are you? If, if you could just tell us a little bit about the request and, and um, we saw the materials and I, I wanna congratulate you. It looks like you've got unanimous support for the um, repairs to the private way. So if you could tell us a little bit about the request and then I will turn it to the board. Sure. Um, I'm, I don't know how familiar you are with our street, but it is, um, our road is way beyond its life expectancy. Um, really and truly, we had hoped, we wanted to pave years ago. Um, we were very successful to get that um, uh, gas main line repaired. So now that the work is complete, um, we are really excited to move forward with the repairs um, and pave the road. So on behalf of the neighbors, we all got together, decided that the betterment uh, plan through the town was was the best program I think for us to to help us fund this. Okay, great. Thank, thank, thank you. And again, for the public's benefit, Regis Road runs right to to Everett Street at at the um, at the Thompson School, I believe, between River Street and Everett Street. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, all right. I will turn to the board, Mr. Hurd. I will move approval. And the chair touched on this, but. I would say we get a lot of these applications. It's always good to see a unanimous 100% approval of the request because it makes us feel like we're not forcing this on anyone. So yes. congratulations on a positive and successful outreach program. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Mr. Diggins. I'll second that. Congratulations, good luck. Thank you, Mr. Diggins, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you very much. Yeah, happy to support this and uh, thank you for your good work in your neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. We, did, we, did, we need you to unmute again, Mrs. Mahan, sorry. I don't know why I keep muting myself. I'm just gonna have to leave it open. Um, uh, thank you to Ms. Gottlieb for working with the neighbors and the neighbors, thank you for um, really coming on board with this. I know the seniors have been through this on uh, Regis and University Road, so uh, happy to support this motion. Yeah. Great, thank, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. I'm happy to support it as well. I just, one comment, we had um, neighbors of yours in a few weeks ago on, on Wellesley and Patrick Streets requesting stop signs, which I'm happy to report have been installed. And when I looked at the area, there is not a stop sign at Regis. The road wasn't in very good condition, so you really couldn't go down it at speed. But I, once you complete the, the road work, um, think about 
if you want to come back to us with that type of request, because I think that's going to become a more appealing street to travel down. And there is a dangerous, potentially dangerous intersection there where it meets with Purcell on the other side. Yes, absolutely agreed. Um, I mean, I'm still surprised at the number of people that fly down our street right now <laughs> um, with the potholes. And it's very concerning, I think, to a lot of us uh, with the school right there um, that someone just blows right through there. And it, it just seems to me that there should be a stop sign there. Okay, so so we will, um, for our select board office, maybe reach out to you. I, I don't know what the timing is for your work, but maybe we can coordinate something as we move forward on that. That's great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So on a uh, motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins for approval, Attorney Heim. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Corsi. We, we, we uh, opened this for us public hearing for- Oh, you know, I always do that. This is a public hearing, so I don't know if there's anybody who wishes to be heard on it. Thank, thank you for that reminder. There are no hands being raised. Okay, all right. So that closes the public hearing. And um, again, we have a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for coming in this evening. Sure. All right, next on the agenda is open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. With that, I will uh, open it up. Um, Mr. Chapdelaine, if we have anybody who wishes to be heard on open forum. Yes, there's one hand raised right now, uh, two hands. The first name is Rebecca Gruber. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Gruber. Good evening, thank you. Rebecca Gruber, Pleasant Street. Town meeting member precinct date. Thank you select board for this opportunity to speak and please don't hear this as an attack, but rather as a plea, a plea for transparency in the decision making regarding reprecincting. I've been engaged in the reprecincting process ever since town clerk Ms. Brazil casually mentioned her proposal to reduce the number of precincts to 16 at the May 20th Envision Arlington Standing Committee meeting. Since then, besides taking advantage of the information and opportunities shared on the town's website, I have also attended election modernization committee meetings and select board meetings and have exchanged correspondence with both you and the EMC, all in an effort to understand the benefits of reducing our number of precincts. One of the two reasons I have most often heard regarding reducing our number of precincts is to improve diversity and equity representation. Yet when I've pushed for specifics, none have been given, nor has there been any evidence given of how our current precincts are lacking in diversity and equity representation. I've heard that one goal is to create precincts in which those who live in larger apartment buildings have more proportional representation. I would be in support of this goal, recognizing that the residents of many of the larger apartment buildings are renters, older and lower income but no actual evidence of this goal exists since both of the proposed town draft precinct maps split up the precinct nine voting block of the two Arlington Housing Authority apartment buildings, Winslow Tower and Chestnut Manor. The other reason I've heard for reducing the number of precincts is to improve the efficiency of running elections. While I appreciate the intricacies of running elections, especially with the coming of no excuses, absentee voting and in-person early voting, I don't think reducing the complexity of the town's clerk's job is a good reason for the chaos that will ensue by changing everyone's precinct and requiring every town meeting member to run. Select board members, the decisions you make about reprecincting will be ones Arlington will live with for the next 10 years. I therefore implore you to make clear and transparent the benefits of reducing the number of our precincts from 21 to 16 if indeed such benefits exist. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gruber. 
The next speaker is Elizabeth Dre. Good evening, Ms. Dre. Good evening. Thank you. Um, uh, Elizabeth Dre, Jason Street. As a resident currently engaged in anti-racist work, I support and applaud the re-precincting working group's goal of ensuring fair representation and equity in our precincts. I also support transparent and data-driven decision-making, <clears throat> especially regarding voting and resident engagement. It's therefore crucial that the working group support their proposal to redraw every precinct boundary for reasons of equity with the most recent accurate data available before asking the select board to vote on a map that would require every town meeting member to run for a seat, even if they just won last year, to permanently reduce the number of voting locations by 20%, to decrease resident representation by reducing the number of town meeting members by 5%, and in general causing complete chaos in April elections with likely over 252 candidates on the ballot. <clears throat> the working group has not done that. In fact, they're knowingly using outdated and incorrect demographic data from 2019, even though the rough 2020 census numbers have been available since August 12th, and the final census data unchanged from August 12th came out September 15th. They've shared no data to support their assertion that the newly drawn precincts, be they 21 or 16, are more fair or equitable than what we currently have, nor have they explained what these concept, concepts even mean. Currently, they're asking the select board to approve a major disruption for every single Arlington resident and town meeting member to fix a problem that there is no data to support even exists. I call on the working group to publicly define what they mean by fair and equitable and what groups they are prioritizing and in what order. I ask them to add the 2020 census demographic information to the current and proposed maps to show us that the new precincts will in fact be more equitable than the current ones. And I ask them to make public all specific instances of inequity, unfairness, or dilution of minority representation that exists in our current map. Only then will I have the information I need to make an informed decision, and only then will you. And if they can't support their claims with data, then I urge the select board to vote against their proposal and to adopt a 21 precinct map that disrupts the minimal number of precincts possible. If they can support the claim, then I'm happy to reconsider my request. And meanwhile, let's work towards that goal of fair and equitable representation in town elections and government an area that Arlington Fights Racism has been leaning on. Let's form a town, town group whose focus is to encourage residents from typically underrepresented communities to run for office, to focus on actions that will inform, engage, and increase voter turnout in these specific communities. Perhaps this venue civic engagement group in coalition with Arlington Fights Racism can lead on efforts to achieve this important goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Mr. Chairman, there's one more hand raised, Beth Malofchik. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Milovchuk. Good evening, uh, Beth Milovchuk, Russell Street. Uh, thank you. Um, I am concerned with chaos. I did attend the um, League of Women Voters meeting forum, the, the um, so described public forum. My concerns are that the public was not allowed to ask their questions. The questions were submitted and they were edited and consolidated by a staff member, a planning staff member, I believe. Um, and I asked about this during the breakout session 
and the person who ran the breakout session didn't understand my question and seemed to think that that was a public meeting. I also asked whether the subgroup working on reprecincting the four members, three of whom I believe are employees reporting to the town manager and one is the town clerk. So those four individuals, I asked whether those meetings were public and the person leading the uh, breakout group was unable to answer that. So I think it's a good idea for transparency as the previous two speakers, I believe noted upon, I will be following up my remarks with a, a letter to the select board. I'm very concerned about transparency, about the integrity of elections and about democracy. Uh, recent um, elections nationally have shown the, the indescribable importance of office holders who uphold the integrity of, of the office in um, defending integrity of elections. And I think, um, unfortunately, uh, some of the objectives for uh, reprecincting, redistricting, whatnot. There's, there's just been a lot of confusion, not a lot of transparency. And I think that um, uh, objectives of efficiencies and saving money are, um, uh, to me, just really confusing. I don't, I don't see the merits of that in, in wanting to defend democracy. I have a background in uh, Russian and Soviet area studies. I so studied in the Soviet Union three times. I, am, I have firsthand experience with authoritarian regimes. So when I hear the words efficiencies, I, um, I take pause, I pay attention. And then with a $187 million yearly budget, the notion of wanting to create chaos across town, um, I don't see the merit. My buzz is Thank going off as well. I'm missing the love check. So if you could yes, just I'll close. Uh, wrap it Thank up, please. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. I'll close. So I, efficiency and saving money in that context is inexplicable. But I will follow up with a letter. Thank you for these, um, the ability to speak. Sure. Thank you very much. All right. I believe that is it this evening for open forum. Um, all right. Um, we will move on to traffic rules and orders and other business. Item 10, Pop Arlington Holiday Market at Visitor Center in Uncle Sam Plaza. Ali Carter, Economic Development Coordinator. Good evening, Ms. Carter. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, Ali Carter, Economic Development Coordinator in the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, so I'm here tonight with a proposal to um, use a town-owned uh, structure that is during a period when it's not currently in use to do a pop-up holiday market. Um, so at the Visitor Center in Uncle Sam Plaza, I did run this by the ATED committee who manages that property and got their approval. Um, but essentially uh, drafted an RFP um, for, we'd like to have um, small entrepreneurs have week long pop-ups from the period between Thanksgiving and um, December 23rd. And um, the idea is that it was like a business recruitment effort to maybe help um, fill some of the vacant storefronts in town. I put out an expression of interest form that was just a simplified form, hoping to just gauge the interest in this. And I was expecting to get somewhere between five and 10 responses and I would have been happy, but I ended up with 58 um, people filling out the form and saying they'd love to get a shot at a space to test out the market in Arlington. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the memo I provided or the RFP. Great. Thank you, Ms. Carter. And I will uh, turn to the board, uh, Mr. Diggins. Uh, I will motion to approve this, I mean, if that's the right motion. And I, I, um, I'm very excited about this. This is a great idea. And, uh, and, and uh, even if you had gotten fewer than five, I, mean, I was going to say, 
keep at it, I mean, not simply this year, but I mean, and, and maybe um, some other locations. I mean, and, and I love the scoring algorithm uh, that you have, I mean, to help me I mean, uh, select amongst them. I mean, and, 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 um, and I know that we, we all care about the diversity and inclusion. Uh, and and I, I would say this is a really good way, you know, to maybe reach out, I mean, to other communities. I mean, and I don't know if me scoring for a diversity is something that you might want to explicitly state I mean in the scoring algorithm. Uh, but think about it, you know, because I think it might it might help, you know. Um, and so so um, but but um this is a wonderful idea. And, and so so um more power to you and and um fifty eight. You're gonna have a hard problem selecting, but that's a great problem to have, huh? And uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that suggestion. That's that's really good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. I heartily second the motion. It's a, it's a great idea. And, um, you know, an, another really creative, fresh, uh, out of the box uh, idea that, to which we have become accustomed from, from Ms. Carter and, and her colleagues. Um, but, um, but thank you for, for the good thought and for the hard work, the, the thought that went into the, to the whole application and to the, to the scoring criteria uh, is evident. And uh, I'm excited to go to see uh, what you select. I'm glad I don't have to do the selecting. So good luck with that. And um, and I look forward to to uh, seeing what we can go by in Arlington Center during this month. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you once again, Ms. Carter, Ali, for <laughs> really diving head first into this. Um, uh, an obvious testament is that it looks like the, the four weeks you'll have a limited amount of people, uh, businesses that can participate. You've got 58. So um, I, my question is uh, for the visitor center, you're going to be able to pick four vendors for four weeks. Does that mean, my first question is, does that mean for the four weeks it's the same four vendors? or each week it's for different vendors or a combination thereof? I think we're um, gonna have to look at the RFP responses, but my intent is to have um, four different vendors with one week uh, sessions. And what I can do with the other respondents is, um, you know, it sort of creates a bench of people that can be referrals to um, folks who want a waiver by doing a pop-up for the vacant storefront bylaw or just referrals for longer term tenants. So I plan on using that longer list, longer and term. My, thank you, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. My second question is um, to go, going over your memorandum uh, we have the visitor center, and I think what I read is we've had we have other vacant storefronts that are available. Are you incorporating in this program uh, with the 58 inquiries who are interested to possibly um, not just at the visitor center? I know you kind of said this, but I'd like to kind of have you expand on a little bit that. Um, it's not just the visitor center, but maybe pop-ups in some of these vacant storefronts in Arlington? Yes, thank you. So the the RFP is for the visitor center because it's a town-owned property. And I think that will get a smaller number of responses just because it's so much more detail. Um, however, the timing of this is really nice because the state of emergency ended June 15th we reinstated the vacant storefront bylaw and the 90 day time limit was up on September 13th. So in the last two weeks, I've been following up with property owners who've had vacancies for over 90 days and way longer than that, right? Um, so I already have some people who are willing to host. It will be a little bit longer of a negotiation process, but the good part about there's many good parts about that bylaw, um, if I can tip my hat to attorney Heim for that. But one of the um, one of the parts about it that I like is that for the lease 
uh, the temporary lease agreement, the town, the Department of Planning and Community Development sets the terms of it. So we can set it at a discounted rate for the pop-up tenant so that they're not, you know, it really is just a short opportunity to give them a step up and it won't be, you know, it gives the landlord an incentive to participate because they'll be making money rather than paying money to the town. Um, but it also gives someone who may not be totally have like a bank loan together or anything like that, just a chance to try something out. Okay, that sounds fantastic. And thank you so much, Allie and Attorney Heim and everybody else who beyond the visitor center, uh, we have some opportunities. But the town of Arlington, uh, they're not making any money on you know, the uh, vacant business storefronts, but we're doing everything we can for, um, I know a lot of residents in the town have said, you know, we have a lot of vacant storefronts. Why isn't the town doing anything? Which is really hard for us to do anything because we don't have much legal standing. But um, between you and um, Attorney Hyman, the town manager, town meeting, um, we're doing the best we can to assist. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mrs. Carter for that presentation. This is really an excellent idea and um, I look forward to it. And I'd call it a pilot program, right? Because it's so much interest. You know, we have a limited set of dates in this proposal, but if it works, we can certainly extend it into the nicer months. I'm thinking of some outdoor legal work, maybe, but I'll wait for the next summer. Um, but I do know ATED has been really looking to get more foot traffic through the newly renovated visitor center. It's been painted. It's, it has a new floor that I just saw was put in. So they put a lot of work into making that nice and it will be a good way to get some get some, some residents to flow through there and help some local businesses. So I think this is an excellent idea and happy to support. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Hurd. I'm also happy to support it. And I, I really like the idea with the level of interest here, there may be opportunities to fill some vacant storefronts, as you mentioned. And, and uh, I had heard you say that to members of the Chamber of Commerce at a, at a recent event. And I think that was well received by the, uh, the Chamber and, and hopefully something comes out of that. So thank you for your creativity on this, uh, Ms. Carter. And uh, thank you to Attorney Heim um, uh, as well for the creativity on the vacant storefront, uh, the two of you working together because this is now a, a real potentially positive use of, of um, that that um, bylaw. So on a motion by Mr. Diggins, second, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Hine. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Vaughn? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you all. Thank you so Thank you, much. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Okay, now, item 11 is a vote for the select board designee to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, Affordable Housing Trust Fund is in Title II, Article 14 of our town bylaws. It was created at the special town meeting in November of 2020. We have appointed all of the members of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund except one. And the bylaw says that the composition shall include a member of the select board. So in order to allow the, the trust to start its business, work on a declaration of trust that they would come back to the select board on, we need to select a member. So um, I don't know if there's any members who are interested. I'm just going in the order that I went in uh, from the beginning of the meeting. So I will start with Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as the junior member of the of the, the board, I will defer to any members who, who would want to do this, but uh, I would be very happy to, to serve the role. I think that my uh, it, it interest was fired in uh, for affordable housing was fired when I was working with the CPA committee. And um, I know a couple of the, the people in the on the trust um, and respect them a great deal. So um, I'm happy to do it, but I am sincerely uh, also very willing to uh, to yield to any of my more senior colleagues who uh, who also have an interest. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Um, Mrs. Mahan. Um, if nobody had an interest, which I already hear that 
um, my colleague, Mr. Helmut does. I would volunteer myself, but um, I think I know everybody, my colleagues um, know that I'm uh, sensitive to balancing family and select board duty. So uh, right now, I, I think I'm here. Mr. Helmut um, is willing to take on this, and I agree with the CPA tie-in as well as towns. Um, that would be admirable, but I'd like to hear if any of my other colleagues uh, between Mr. DeCourcy, her Diggins, if they're interested. So I won't make a motion right now. I'd like to hear from my other three remaining colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hurd. I am happy to serve on this. Um, affordable housing has certainly been something that has been talked about and there's been a lot of excitement about this particular, about the trust fund, but I'm also happy to start to defer to Mr. Helmuth if Mr. Helmuth wants to serve as well. Um, just time constraints, sometimes it depends on where I am in, in the roller coaster of my law practice. So if Mr. Helmuth is interested in serving and has the ability to commit his time to it, then I'm happy to support his, his role on the trust fund. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. It is with a big sigh of relief I hear at least two people wanting to do this. You know, because I'm, you know, I'm doing the, the Housing Plan Implementation Committee and I, I, I have my hands and my head um, full with that one. Uh, and, and I really feel that we um, be someone with, with a deeper background you know, in housing, a respect for, with respect to the financing um, element of it and with a more of a legal background uh, would be great at that. And that leaves all four of you in a better position uh, than me for it. And, uh, so so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sit back and watch how this unfolds, but, you know, I'll end up voting for somebody other than me and I'm looking forward to it, you know? Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Diggins. I wanna thank Mr. Hurd and, and Mr. Helmuth uh, for their expressions of interest on this. One thing I will say is that the board, no matter who the designee is, the board does have a significant role here because the trust needs to come back to the select board once the declaration of trust is committed. And there's a lot of activities of the trust that are subject to the approval of the select board. So I, I, I think we will, no matter who the designee is, it, it, there, there's there's an active or a role for us here and, and, and the trust will be coming back. So I I don't make motions. So I, I see Mr. Hurd uh, putting his hand up. So I, I will turn to him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion to appoint Mr. Helmuth to the uh, the board does need to the affordable housing trust fund. I'll second that. Okay. All right. And the motion has been made and made by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Diggins. Any other comments? Okay. All right. I, I, and, and thank you, Mr. Helmuth. And thank you, Mr. Hurd for, for your willingness as well. This is one of those things where the bylaw, or we need a member from the board and I appreciate you both um, for, for your willingness. And, and um, so with that, I will turn to attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helmer. So now that completes, the Board of Trustees is now complete. So the um, we will get in touch with the trustees and, and certainly the first meeting um, can be undertaken and, and, and the group can get going. So um, that's, that's great. Item 12 is discussion and approval, letter to Massport Community Advisory Committee, Christine Bongiorno, Director of Health and Human Services. Good evening, Ms. Bongiorno. Good evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity. 
uh, to present. So uh, I have with me uh, Pat Martin and um, Myron Kasaraba from Belma. Um, so Pat Martin is our lead health compliance officer. He's going to give you a, a brief, uh, the, the goal tonight is to be very brief, we, we understand that, uh, presentation on, on his role on the Massport uh, Community Advisory Committee and um, answer any questions that you may have. And then Myron will also be available to answer questions. And, and Myron is from Belmont um, and he's the representative from Belmont. So I'll, I'll Toss it over to Pat, Pat Martin. Good evening, Mr. Martin. Uh, good evening, good evening, everyone. All right, so I'll just give you a you know brief bit of background on this. So uh, back in 2013, the FAA had made changes uh, to the flight path for aircraft departing runway 33L. Prior to this change, departure aircraft were, you know, was uh, controller based. Uh, which you know, resulted in aircraft uh, flying over a larger area. Basically, it was uh, you know, more dispersed. They weren't concentrated over any one place. Uh, planes are currently using uh, area navigation standard injury, uh, instrument departure, uh, also known as RNAV uh, SID. Uh, this departure allows um, you know, uh, aircraft to use a you know, standard flight path uh, you know, when, when leaving. Uh, the negative to uh, RNAV, uh, well, this RNAV departure is that the flight paths are highly concentrated. So should you happen to live under one of those flight paths or uh, very near it, you're getting all of the air, uh, air traffic that's uh, flowing through that area. So uh, the FAA has uh, put forth the proposal um, you know, and I don't know, am I actually, am I able to share my screen? You should be able to. Is it showing up at the bottom of your screen? Hold on, let me see here. Yep, share screen. Perfect. Here we go. Okay, so um, you know, a picture's worth a, a thousand words and an easier explanation. So what we have here, the white tracks are, you know, what, uh, you know, the current RNAV said. So you can see over Arlington, you know, we have a couple of a uh, couple of flight paths, and you know, it's it's mostly concentrated over East Arlington, um, you know, which is the area that's mostly mostly affected by it. So the the uh, 33L communities have long been asking for you know some sort of dispersion uh, to make it more equitable. So you know, uh, not just our residents, but residents in other communities, uh, you know, could share the burden. This is what the FAA has put uh, forward. Uh, unfortunately, you know, as you can see, the green paths are, um, you know, not not very different. So, in other words, this isn't dispersion. It's really just shifting the burden uh, ever so slightly. And um, you know, and the big negative for Arlington in this case is if you look at the two green tracks. Um, I'm not sure if my curves are showing up, but you, know, you see here. Uh, you know, in Arlington, it shifts them further north. So people who have been affected by it are not likely to see a, a whole lot of relief, um, but we are, we would likely see a whole uh, bunch of residents uh, that haven't been affected by it um, now hearing aircraft noise uh, at, a, at a much higher rate than they were previously. So a couple of the community members, uh, you know, that are, you know, that, that, um, do have a lot of interest in this. Uh, I've spoken to one of them and uh, I received an email from another and you know they're uh, very much not in favor uh, of, uh, of the proposed change uh, simply because it's not not what uh, the communities have been asking for. Um, so that more or less uh, sums it up. On October 6th the uh, Massport uh, Community Advisory Committee will be uh, meeting again, uh, a vote may come up at that time, uh, whether or not uh, to vote in favor or against this proposal. Um, so I was hoping to get some feedback from the select board um, you know, on this matter. Thank, thank you, Mr. Martin. I, 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 is there anything further, Ms. Bongiorno, that you wanted to present or do you want me to um, open it up to questions and comments from the board? Nothing additional for me. Okay. All right. And, and one question for Mr. Chapdelain. We saw the memo. There was a reference to a letter. Is the letter um, that that wasn't 
in the packet. I think there's a request for us to sign on to a letter, but I don't know if that um, can be made available or, or maybe we can ask what the, the, the request is to join with other communities that would like to see further dispersion for those flights are taking off from one runway 33L. Is that to summarize it, what you're looking for? Correct, and the, and the letter is now available on Novus for board members to view. Okay. Um, and, and, and basically, correct me if I'm wrong, Christine or Pat or Myron, but the letter would be objecting to this current proposal, which would shift more burden to Arlington. Correct, yes. Okay, all right. I will now turn to the members of the board and I'll start with Mrs. Mahan. Um, move approval. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hurd? I will move, I will second that. Um, that. That is the letter. It's just it, it essentially saying that we object to the, to the new flight patterns. And I would just say with this, I defer to the experts who interpret the patterns better than I can. So if it's, it's if the, Experts who have looked at it have seen that it, it's worse off for the town than I certainly would be in favor of sending this letter. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Diggins. Yes, thank you. I have some questions. Um, so what was the pattern before um, they did the new dispersion pattern? Not before they did the change that you're objecting to now, but you know, before they did the, the more narrow flight pattern, like what was the dispersion rate over Arlington at that point? Uh, so, in terms of like a specific rate, it would uh, it would be difficult to 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 say. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't. Uh, there are certain slides that could kind of show it, but basically, you know, um, when looking at the map, I mean, you could clearly see the uh, the concentrated flight paths that are that are currently present. Um, and if you could look at a map from uh, prior to uh, 2013, you know, it's just dispersed over a much greater greater area. Um, so all the areas that are kind of in between those flight paths would be, uh, would be filled in by aircraft as well. Not just, not just those, uh, you know, I, for lack of a better way of saying it, highways in the sky. <laughs> gotcha. So what's the rationale that the FAA has for, um, for doing this pattern? So, uh, their rationale is that, uh, it improves safety and, uh, efficiency at the airport. Safety, huh? So, so, so what, what level of safety being, I mean, I mean, what's, I want to understand more about that because that's, a, that's um, important. So that might be a little difficult for me to say as uh, Myron, I think he unmuted and, uh, and might be able to say a little bit more about that if, uh, if he doesn't mind. <laughs> uh, sure, hi, hi everyone. Uh, so if you can see my screen, let me see if I can um, zoom this in a little bit, but basically prior to 2013, um, you can see the, uh, blue tracks here. Um, the, the reality is that all of the flights were being managed by air traffic control. So depending on what the uh, utilization was in the airspace, depending on what the destination was, um, uh, basically they would spread the planes out um, uh, you know, pretty randomly. And you can see that they turned a lot earlier um, over Somerville and parts of Cambridge, and actually Arlington and Belmont got very little traffic. Um, the advantage of doing what they did in 2013, um, which is you know putting in these uh, yellow flight tracks, was um, it's all done by computer. So the uh, basically the um, pilot is given uh, one of these four branches based on the the waypoint. They plug it into their flight computer, and um, uh, you know, basically, the plane flies by wire uh, over these tracks. And um, again, what it what it did was, uh, you know, for Belmont, we ended up with three of the concentrated flight paths um, directly over our town. Uh, Arlington got two of them. Uh, Medford got, um, uh, you know, all of the flight paths uh, going over the single. Um, uh, single waypoint and in you know in their defense of uh, the you know moving to satellite based gps navigation is more predictable um, and uh, there's less variability there's less opportunity for human error and so therefore 
from a safety and efficiency standpoint, they have a, a justification. The problem is that the way they achieve that is by, you know, concentrating and putting all of the airplanes on these um, on these concentrated uh, tracks. Right. Thanks. So I heard maybe uh, a, a while ago that there is like a plan for a next generation of flight management where the 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 planes will be able to the pilots will be able to kind of navigate in on their own paths I mean it, once again it'll be integrated in am i right about that or or completely off base yeah i actually asked dr hansman from mit the, that question on thursday night there was a public information session and um i think theoretically um you you could you should be able to use the technology to say, well, why not have 50 flight tracks? Um, because they're all being you know, run by a computer using artificial intelligence. And the reality is I think that um, that could be decades away. Um, I think this is a you know, sort of a first step down an automation path, but um, the, the real limitation is the, uh, uh, that a lot of the airplanes that are still currently flying are 20 or 25 years old. And, if you can remember how much memory your computer had 25 years ago um, uh, compared to what you're carrying in your pocket today, um, it, 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 there's a big difference. And so I think that uh, they have to use systems that basically can adapt or can be used by um, you know, the, the current fleet. Um, so I, I think there is a, a future scenario. Um, you know, we've got companies like MITRE um, and, and Raytheon that are working on these types of navigation systems just you know right here in Massachusetts, but uh, I think it's a ways off. Right. Well, I live in East Arlington. I hear the planes. You know, and every time I go to Logan you know, by subway, I am happy that the airport is close by. Uh, but the consequence of having an airport close by is that I get to hear the planes be you know, take off. <laughs> They're not as close as if I were in Medford you know, or 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 um, East Boston. Uh, but but you know, safety is a big deal. I mean, and unless someone tells me, you know, that the safety claims are bogus, I me mean, then I think I me mean, the more concentrated flight paths are the way to go. I mean, uh, uh, and and you know, to the extent the little bit of dispersion makes it a little louder for some more people in in Arlington, by definition, makes it less loud for some people. So so they're trying, you know, uh, but but I just can't in good faith I mean um, argue against it. So. So I will not be voting for it. I'll probably be in the minority, but that's okay. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you. Um, I think I will support this uh, mainly because it, it, seems, it sounds to me from what we've been told that this proposal doesn't really solve the problem that it's, you know, it's, it's the, the communities have, have asked for. And, you know, I think that it's not really a question of just not, I like not in my backyard, not in my airspace. You know, it's not, it's not just, it's not that. I think you, you make a good point that we all share the burden. Um, but if it's, if it's just going to make things worse for more people in our community and it's not providing relief, you know, elsewhere um, to other communities in a significant way, then I, you know, I think that it's worth asking them to try again. So I would support the, support the letter. Yeah, Adam, just just to clarify for Mr. Diggins, the the I think what we're we're doing the same thing in Belmont is the 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 vote is really as to whether to support alternative tracks. It's not to go back to what was before. So I, what is are the concentrated flight tracks? Um, there's just a proposal that's been put forward to try to that MIT tried to address the requests that we made about dispersion and um, and we don't think that the alternative that they came up with was what you know uh, what we were asking for so I think that's you know and Belmont I'm recommending as well that we reject this um, th this uh, new new proposal mr chair can, can I ask one yeah, more question? one second mr Diggins are you are you all set mr Helmut Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, okay, Mr. Diggins. Yeah, thank you. So is there a possible plan that you think will, 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 would make people happy or, or less unhappy? Um, 
I'm not sure if there is. Uh, Myron, I just noticed you, you unmuted. So, um, you know, any, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, currently, no, this was the best plan that they were, uh, that they were able to come up with. Uh, you know, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean that, you know, further plans can't be investigated. Um, but I think Myron might have a better sense on, uh, on that. Yeah, as you know, you know, Frank Ciano and I have been working on this for eight years and um, and there were several uh, rotational plans that were uh, proposed where, um, again, ideally you would move, you would have more tracks that were used less frequently. So um, I do think that that, you know, telling the FAA, thanks for trying for the last four years, well, actually for MIT trying for the last four years, but I think they need to be pushed to continue to try to use the technology to create more variations. So, so you know, I'm not a flight path designer, but um, I, I would think that um, you know, there should be a way that they could, um, you know, come up with something that's more more fair and equitable than what they've got today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, yeah, so I have a, a few comments. I'm, I'm actually, the wind was blowing out of the Northwest tonight. My house is directly under one of the flight paths. And, and I agree with Mr. Diggins to the extent when you live close to the airport, that, that is a benefit, right? You, you, you're able to get there quickly. Not a benefit to have the planes overhead a lot, but it, you're, you're close and it's understandable that that's gonna happen. Um, I do see from, if you look when, when planes are taking off, I think they, they head up right to the intersection Route 93 and Route 16, and that's when they start veering into the, the various communities, and you see it coming over Arlington quite a bit. And while personally, um, I accept that as part of living close to the airport, I do see that there, there may be some merit to trying to disperse that area a little bit further um with other communities but i do want to ask what is the status of um other communities that that are in the flight path of 33l um what they have done to date as far as signing on to a letter um to the faa if we know so uh uh medford uh, sent a letter uh to uh you know um you know legislators you know basically um you know expressing their disappointment in the proposal and encouraging them to uh push the faa to um you know continue to work on this and try to develop a a plan that is uh that is more equitable um outside of that i'm not sure what other communities have done a lot of the other uh, cac members uh still have to meet with their uh you know with their select boards and uh you know and and get feedback um yeah so as far as where things are at this exact moment it's uh it, it's hard to say though the the sense is many of the communities are uh, are not in favor of this uh of this current proposal uh and myron i don't know if you want to chime in on this a bit you might uh you might have your finger a little bit uh well actually you definitely have your finger a little bit more on the pulse than um than i do with uh, the other communities and where they might be at yeah, we've had a working group uh, with uh, Medford, uh, Watertown, Cambridge, Somerville, and Arlington, and we've been coordinating uh, closely. There was a, uh, the, uh, Massport and MIT and the FAA had a public information session last Thursday, so I think everybody was waiting for that information session. I'm scheduled to meet with, with our select board on, on the 4th, uh, so next Monday. Um, and I know that, um, uh, as, as Pat mentioned, uh, Medford has already sent a letter, uh, I think uh, about a month ago uh, from their mayor. Um, so in general, I believe that the sentiment is, it's not what we were hoping for. Um, okay, yeah, no, I, I, I can go along with supporting this letter. One thing I also wanna add, and, and one thing that I find here, and I don't know if this has been addressed at any of the meetings, but Often what happens, particularly if there are weather events, you get flights leaving between midnight and, and 1.30 in the morning. And a lot of times it's FedEx and UPS flights that are that have left late over the area. And it seems to me that when the, the traffic is not that great, there should be a way to disperse it um, so that it is not constantly over certain areas. Because that's that's the time where I 
really seem to notice it. And just to the point on the dispersion, there are some days where it is one flight right after another that goes overhead, notwithstanding what the modeling says. And, and I think that's the type of um, spreading uh, the, the, the the noise out that I'd like to see. But I, I understand that on those percent of days that the, that the wind's out of the Northwest, we're gonna get some flights overhead and I accept that, but I can go along with this letter to the extent of asking the FAA and, and Massport to, to look into further alternatives to maybe spread the pain. So um, unless there's any other questions from board members, I'll, I'll go to a vote now. Um, I don't see any hands. So, um, so on a motion by Mrs. Mahan, seconded by Mr. Hurd, uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Uh, Diggins? No. Mr. Helen? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's a 4-1 okay, vote. Thanks. Mr. Diggins voted in the negative. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the presentation tonight. Thank you, everyone. OK. Item 13 is a discussion and vote creation of 2025 celebration committee. Um, and I will turn it over to Mr. Hurd. Thank you. This has been a long time coming to put this on. The 2025 celebration is approaching. It seems far away, but we have to start getting our plans into the federal government. This got rolling prior to COVID and then kind of slowed down and I think all the other cities and towns have slowed down a little bit but seem to be ahead of us at most of the towns that are involved like Concord, Lexington, Bedford, uh, Carlisle have all created their committees to specifically deal with what um, events we're going to run in Arlington during this 2025 April 2025 celebration during uh, Patriot's Day weekend and I think at this point, it'd be good for us to do so. I put this on and then realized I probably should have had a proposal as to what the committee would look like. So I'm happy to hear input from the board, but I know there's at least a few members of ATED that would like to be involved. Uh, there's been some interest from a few individuals that came to ATED meetings that had talked, expressed an interest to be involved in the process. So whether it be I, a few members of ATED and then whoever submits letters of interest to the select board to do so. How many members um, is certainly up to discussion. I just think we need an entity to that's tasked with putting together the plan that we have to submit to the federal government because it will fast approach. We do have a pr very specific set of guidelines as to what that event will look like, um, but it is an opportunity for Arlington who is sort of the forgotten neighbor to Lexington and Bedford and Concord to show some pretty incredible historic places that we have. And we've, as Mr. Helmuth knows, use a lot of CPA funding to put, put a lot of work into that. And uh, I think it will be a really great event. So that is what I'm asking for. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurt. So, just, um, and I will turn to Mr. Diggins in just a moment, but just, do you see this as a committee to, to be created by the select board? This isn't, uh, once we determine what it is, is that? Okay, yeah. all right, um, Mr. Diggins? Well, I'll, I'll make a motion to create the committee, but only if Mr. Hurd is the select board uh, rep for it. <laughs> Ain't no way out of that one. All right. Fine with me. <laughs> That's it for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Helmut? Yes, I, I second all of that. <laughs> so I think it's a great idea. Um, do we need to, Mr. Chair, do we need to define the members of the committee right now? I, I, I think maybe what we do tonight is vote for the creation of the committee and maybe ask Mr. Hurd to come back with uh, mm -hmm. how it, um, what the composition should be uh, just in the interest of time. Okay, good. Yes, yeah, so I second, second that. And um, one suggestion that just that you, you probably have thought of is, is a participation by a uh, designee from the Historical Society or the Historic Commission, whichever would be appropriate, you know, would, would certainly inform, uh, well, the history, so. Um, but it's a great, great bunch of people. I think you won't have any trouble, trouble getting um, participation, both from the, the tourism and economic development angle 
and historic angle, I think it's a really good idea to, to bring those two together and to try to get us on the map in a way that more than the way that we deserve. So thank you for, for this. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if the answer is readily at hand or once we start the committee, it will then become evident um, in terms of uh, applying for any either federal designation, recognition, or funding, um, is that something that Arlington would stand alone in applying for that? Or is that something once this committee is created, um, we would anticipate joining with a Lexington, Concord, et cetera, on doing that? So again, if, if the answer is not readily at hand tonight, we can get it at some other time. And I know, Mr. Hurd, do you have any um, comments on that? Don't know. I know we have the battle road designation, but I don't know how that affects our the our ability to find funding. But I can certainly find out. We I think we do have some meetings coming up with the other towns that I can gauge how they're funding their their um, events. But it's also part of the reason for getting ahead of this and creating the committee is that if we're going to have to set aside funds to have a couple of years lead time to to save up so but i'll come back with a, a try to get an answer for that mrs ma thank you mr hart thank you mr chair i'm very very happy to support this great thank, thank you mr Mahan. i'm also happy to support this um and and so just to frame the motion so we have a motion to support the creation of the committee with a request from mr hurd to come back with more specifics to the board at a future meeting is that um, okay? Fair to say. So that is a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth. Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, all right. Item 14 is a discussion and vote timeline for requesting expressions of interest, marijuana and all alcohol package store licenses. Um, Douglas Heim Town Council. Before I turn it over to Attorney Heim, we did vote this earlier in the year. There are a few administrative issues, so we need to set some new dates. So with that, I will turn it to Attorney Heim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll keep this relatively short. We originally had a date for package store licenses to sort of open to be available for application on or about August 1st. Um, and to close that period in August 27th, um, and then to have a hearing on September 13th. Uh, obviously, that didn't really happen. Um, there may not have been as acute interest in package store licenses we had originally perceived, but the long and short of it is, is that what it proposed to do is to amend that date so that um, we open uh, receipt of package store license immediately, and then we basically uh, close uh, receipt of those by October 29th and schedule any um, competition for that license at your next uh, select board meeting. If the if we don't receive any applications by that October um, that October deadline, there's no reason that we have to you know perceive proceed as if it's closed, but um, we'll leave it open basically if we don't have, um, applications by that point in time. Um, similarly, um, the host community agreement process for retail licenses, um, our original plan um, had a date that was um, essentially that they would open on September 15th and close on October 15th. That's not quite as uh, delayed, but um, instead I think what I propose is to open October 1st for those, um, there's not a lot more legwork that needs to be done there. And close on October 29th, we're fairly clear that there are already a couple of interested parties who are essentially waiting. So there's don't wanna put it out for too much longer. And then hear those applications either on the November 8th or November 22nd meeting of the select board, depending on what the board thinks, uh, essentially just making sure that we give enough time for the marijuana study group to provide comment to the board. Um, again, I think while we anticipate some interest, I don't think we anticipate 
a lot of new applicants. I think we'll probably be seeing some applicants that we've seen before, and that cuts down on the administrative time that we'll need once we receive them. Um, and then finally, um, host community agreements for delivery. Uh, I'd be looking to essentially come back to the board uh, with a date to open sometime in December. Uh, I don't think the board currently has a December meeting scheduled. Um, and then we would be considering applications for those HCAs sometime in, in late January, early February, depending on, again, the marijuana study group's availability within that time period. So just to recap, I think we'd be looking um, to open alcohol licenses uh, immediately um, and essentially close those at the end of October um, and have the board uh, take up any applications that are submitted to it um, at its uh, next earliest meeting. Uh, the HCA for retail marijuana, which I think is probably uh, takes a little bit more time and energy of both the board and, and the marijuana study group, for example, would be opened October 1st, closed October 29th, and that the board would either be prepared to hear those at the earliest on its meeting on November 8th, at the latest it's November, uh, November 22nd. Okay, thank you, Attorney Heim. And, and just for clarification, October 29th is a Friday. So that's that's the, uh, that'd be the last business day in October. Um, and you, my recollection is we, we did not vote on the delivery license and we won't be taking a vote on that this evening either. It's just the all alcohol package store license and the HCA for retail, is that correct? Yes, I'm sorry. That's the recommendation? Correct. Yes. Okay. All right, great. All right, I will turn it to the board, uh, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, I will move to um, approve those dates. And uh, so I have no further comment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Thank you, I'll second that. Uh, just a, a, quick, a quick question to Mr. Heim, if I could. Did, so did, did we receive any applications for package store at all during the period? Not yet. Okay, yeah. Um, so I think it, it, it's fair to leave that open. And if we don't get any this time, then would it, would it stay open or would we just have the option to reopen it? We, it always stays open. It's not that someone can apply for it. It's that um, originally we thought there might be a little bit more of a competition for the package mm -hmm. store license. The board has traditionally wanted to try to make sure that these are equitably distributed and competitively given. Gotcha. Um, so we're hoping to have a competitive process that doesn't look like that. If we don't get applicants, you know, in advance of those dates, then I think we would just obviously leave it open and, and let folks uh, come to the board um, as they roll in. Got it, yeah, great, thank you. Uh, no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mrs. Mahan. Uh, no questions, thank you. Okay, Mr. Hurd. No comments or questions. Okay, and I don't either I support the, the dates as outlined. So on a motion by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Helmuth, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you folks for, uh, for bearing with me on this. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Uh, next is correspondence received. Item 15, crosswalk across Summer Street at Newland, New, it says Newland Street at Newland Road, Paul Easton 133 Sunset Road. Item 16, errors in draft housing plan, Patricia Warden, 27 Jason Street. And item 17, prioritization for restoration of Cooks Hollow, Beth Malofchuk, 20 Russell Street. Um, Mr. Helmuth. Move receipt. Okay, Mrs. Mahan. Second. Mr. Hurd. No comments. Okay, and Mr. Diggins. Um, so, uh, quick question. Quick question. Ah, my microphone was off. <laughs> uh, quick question. Uh, so, um, are what's the plan to? Um, are we planning to address the crosswalk issue in some way? Um, right now, we have a motion for receipt. If you'd like to amend that for a referral, um, I, it's the chapter. I don't know if a referral to TAC would be appropriate. Or yeah, I, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And given that the residents also wrote to TAC the board formally referring at the TAC would seem to make good sense. Okay, so if we could take that as a uh, friendly amendment, Mr. Helmuth, or? Yes, yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Problem, you're welcome. Okay, um, and I believe that's everybody but me. I have no further uh, questions or comments. So on a motion 
on number 15 to receive and refer to TAC, and on 16 and 17 to receive motion made by Mr. Helmuth, seconded by Mrs. Mahan, Attorney Himes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. It's unanimous vote. Okay. Um, I am going to take new business out of order because we're going to have a request to go into executive session after that, and we won't be returning for that. So for new business, uh, Attorney Heim. No new business. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just two brief pieces of new business. One, uh, this Saturday, I was able to attend an event um, in front of Town Hall. At noon, Mr. Diggins also joined uh, and this event was put together by Mothers Out Front and Sustainable Arlington to advocate for the repair of gas leaks and the eventual, and but hopefully soon, transition off natural gas altogether. Uh, this really was a culmination of a lot of work by the Gas Leaks Task Force over the years to raise awareness about gas leaks in town. Um, but good event. Uh, they get a lot of foot traffic walking by to sign postcards to send to National Grid to ask for or to advocate for fixing the gas leaks. So it was a very positive event being put on. And then the second one I would share, and I think some of you have shared this with me, but I am he I continue to hear from residents um, overwhelming uh, support or approval of the beer garden that's been held at the Jason Russell House lawn. So uh, good, good, good job to the board for uh, for seeing the wisdom of supporting that this year. Great. That, Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Um, Mr. Helmut. Well, the town manager stole my thunder. I was going to also praise the beer garden. <laughs> that is always all right, Mr. Chapdelaine. Um, it was a good idea. And I have to say my, my husband and I enjoyed the very first one of these. And uh, it was it was terrific to see what a, a family focused, family friendly event it was. There were kids running around, uh, adults. You know, the, the alcohol service was, was really well done with perfect uh, responsible uh, hosting. The food was good from Anonymy Tavern. Um, it was a great day out. It was really, really rewarding to see the community um, enjoying themselves. So, um, so it's it, nice to thank us, but it wasn't our idea. Uh, we just, we just said yes. So, uh, thanks to you, Mr. Chaplin, and your, and your team, and the others who uh, who came up with the idea. Thank you, Mr. Helmuth. Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and as uh, the town manager mentioned to me, I was at that event on Saturday, and it was a really, it was a really nice event. Eh? But, but I'm a bit of a mama's boy, so being around a bunch of mothers me, who are fighting, you know, and working hard, you know, to make the world better, me for their kids and grandkids was was, was a pleasant uh, uh, thing to do. Eh? And and there was even one person who uh, was used to be the chair of Sustainable Arlington. Uh, who had a grandmother's out front shirt on. It was really very nice. You know? And I'll also mention uh, that on October 11th, Mr. Helmuth and I are going to be doing an event with the Rainbow Coalition on National Coming Out Day. You know? And so uh, the details haven't been worked out, but, but um, we'll make it interesting. Otherwise, it'll just turn into another brainstorming session. So, so, uh, so come over, hang out, whatever. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to talk about the beer guy, <laughs> so I'll be brief, I guess. But no, it, it was a great event. Um, we went with with the boys, and it, that was just such a perfect location for it. The open, expansive grass in front of the Jason Russell House was really well suited for that type of event, as opposed to what we dealt with before with the train tracks and whatnot so it, it was really well attended i know i talked to billy over at monotony tavern and said that they had a successful stint there as well so i think it's a roadmap for things to come uh, at the jason russell house and it was really a good event and then i just since i have a platform would like to wish happy anniversary 46th anniversary to my mother and father 46 years strong so Usually they watch the meetings, but I think they're out to dinner, so they'll have to watch it on ACMI. Great, great. Well, I hope they're out to dinner tonight. Yeah, and, and congratulations to, to, to Jack and Dale. Um, and this is Mahan. Well, I kind of feel handicapped as I'm not going to speak about the beer gun, um, although I did share it on my Facebook list. Um, my new business is old business. It has to do with... Um, 
the compensation for an essential employees. I just want to stress again that I feel the town should give the maximum, which is $5 million, not $5 to $7 million. And I'm also hoping that, although I haven't heard anything different beyond the one union, that the town manager will please meet with the other unions to negotiate, as he stated he would do, as well as I know for non-union employees, we pretty much sailed through working at home, hybrid remote working, which I'm a supporter of because I've done it as a court reporter. But to date, uh, the one highly relevant union that it would apply to, which would not be police or fire, um, um, has not has, uh, reached out to the town, reached out to human resources, and there has been no meeting scheduled. Whereas non-union employees, it's a done deal as of August 31st. And once again, I feel um, my personal feeling, and if any of my colleagues agree on a giving essential workers the max, which would be five million, which means between the years of 2019 to 2024, all town employees would receive three to four thousand dollars each year for their um, active COVID service um, that are non-union. Uh, employees thankfully don't have to expose themselves to as well as um, it, it should I don't understand the hold up for hybrid remote uh, working with the unions when we've sailed it through with non-union and I'd really like to see a those meetings that I've been told will happen actually happen as well as be the manager reach out to all the unions as he said he would do starting back in end of June, July, uh, to negotiate, and I'd like it to be for the Mets. Sorry to be a uh, Diane Downer, but I'm, I'm still very uh, not happy about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Mahan. Um, so I just have a couple pieces of, of new business. Um, we did have a smaller group of the Long Range Planning Committee meet last week. The full long range planning committee will be meeting on October 15th and then we've got uh, some um, within the five year plan, the um, significant deficits in the future um, to start talking about. I did get asked before the meeting tonight about the reprecincting. Um, there was some earlier on, there was some discussion that we would be talking about the proposed number of precincts tonight, as, as you know, it was not on the agenda. I believe that is going to be on our agenda um, for our next meeting in October. That's my intention right now. I, I, I need to just clear through a few things. And I also want to tell people that we will have the ARPA discussion on at our next meeting, um, which correct me on the day, I believe it's October 13th um, for our next meeting. So that, that will be an agenda item, just like we talked about last time. Um, and we want to get information on the table um, for that meeting. The last thing I want to talk about is, is just, you know, sometimes you look at local government and some things move slower than, than how people would like them to move. And, and sometimes it works. And um, we had a, a hearing at our, I believe it was our last meeting, um, or two meetings ago, because the last meeting was a makeup session for the installation of stop signs at Wellesley Road and Patrick Street. And I want to recognize Mr. Feeney and Mr. Rodemarker and Officer Rateau um, and, and the town manager. Um, that was a concern that neighbors raised to us. We got it on our agenda on September 20th. Officer Rateau took a look from the time the request came in, agreed that there should be a stop sign. We voted it on Monday, September 20th. On Wednesday, September 22nd, the stop signs were installed. Um, and, and that was one of those instances we heard from neighbors. The request was, it made perfect sense. And everybody seemed to work together to get that down. It's one of those instances where I look back on it, that's, uh, you know, really makes you feel good about um, getting some things done in a timely fashion. So thank you to Mr. Feeney and, and Mr. Rodemarker for going out the day after the meeting to check on things and uh, reporting back through the town manager that the installation was going to occur that week, um, which was, was actually the next day. So uh, with that, that will close our um, new business. Um, we do have two executive session items on the agenda. I will read those items and ask for a vote. We will not be coming back as part of the vote. I'll ask that we don't, we will adjourn.
from the executive session. So item A is to conduct a strategy session in preparation for contract negotiations with non-union personnel, the town manager, and or conduct contract negotiations with same. Item B, to comply with or act under the authority of any general special law or federal grant and aid requirements, um, which is the approval of executive session meetings, executive session minute meeting, excess, ex excuse me, executive session meeting minutes of August 9th, 2021. Sorry, it's a tongue twister. So if I could have a motion to uh, go into executive session. Mr. Chair, may I just um, interject something really quickly? Sure, I'm sorry, Attorney Hine. I apologize. I just want to uh, clarify that uh, it's correct to say that uh, the negotiation uh, component of things in, in preparation for strategy in negotiation with uh, the manager would uh, be detrimentally impacted by having a in an open session, correct? Correct. Yeah, thank that's you. right. Th thank, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, move that we go into executive session um, for item A and B, as you have previously stated, and then when we come out of executive session, it is solely for the purposes of a, a motion to adjourn. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Mon, do I have a second? Oh, Attorney Hyde? I'm sorry. Uh, this is my fault. I should have said this. If you want to adjourn from an executive session, you may. Uh, you don't have to come back out if you don't want to. I just want to make that clear. If you want to adjourn from executive session, you may state so now. And I apologize, Ms. Mahan, I should have raised that earlier. I apologize. Okay, if you, if you want to do it that way, in the past, we've always gone into executive session, come out of executive session to the meeting. We either take a vote or we adjourn. So I, I kind of prefer to do that because that's what we've done in the past. It doesn't okay. mean ACMI, you know, hang around and wait for that. But I'd, I'd like to stay with what we've done traditionally is we go into executive session, we come out, we're back in session, we either take a vote, which we're not going to, or we adjourn. And, of course. And that's our of course. Okay. Um, all right. There's a motion by Mrs. Mahan. Do I have a second? Uh, yeah. Seconded by Mr. Hurd. Um, any comments from Mr. Diggins or Mr. Helmut? Just a question. So if we do it the way that Ms. Mahan um, recommended, does ACMI, does, does that require the wait for us to, to finish and then put our adjournment back on broadcast? No, it does not. That's what I just said. They don't, they okay. don't have to hang over. Okay, thank you. Okay. I, All right, Mr. Here. Diggins? Uh, no comment. Okay, okay, I have no comment either. Uh, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Motion carries. We're now in executive session. Great. Thank you.